Hello, today we're going to discuss just how nanomaterials are made. It's first important to realize that we have long since departed from the days when the materials we use to design the things we need were shaped by strong men with loud tools and fancy outdoor fireplaces. In this day and age, most designing is done not on factory floors, but here, using different methods of three-dimensional modeling. In fact, when it comes to nanomaterials and nanoscience, particles need to be manipulated chemically to shape them into our desired structure. Molecular modeling allows you to interpret their behavior in a given condition so that you can shape them into whatever structure you deem fit. Once you have the desired model mapped out, you need to set out to create your design. While there are a plethora of methods for each type of nanoparticle, we are going to spotlight a few in particular to give you an idea of what is going on. Now, regardless of what method you use, however, there are two directions that all methods take, either top-down or bottom-up. Let's start with top-down. In a nutshell, the top-down approach is about taking something large and making it small, but really small because remember, the nanoscale. Let's consider an example. Photolithography is one of the most common practices, so it's a good place to start. Here you are with your silicon dioxide chip, and you want to trace this pattern into it at the nanoscale. But how? Well, first you add a photoresist chemical layer that is broken down by UV rays. Then you place the pattern mask on top of the photoresist layer, and cook it all in UV radiation. When the photoresist layer was exposed, the chemical is broken down and the pattern has now been traced. Alright, so remove the mask and turn off the UV, and instead introduce a chemical bath that eats away at the exposed silicon, but not the photoresist layer. The pattern is now chemically etched into the silicon. So there you go, now you have your silicon chip manipulated on the nano scale. Alright, now on to the bottom-up approach. This is the reverse process, taking something small, like individual atoms, and making them into something larger. So let's try it. Atomic layer deposition? is very commonly used and has been used for decades in varying capacities. Here's how it works. So you, local chemist, want to produce a nanoscale sheet of, say, zirconium dioxide. Well, great. Let's get started with our favorite gray table and a layer of adhesive catalyst. Let's now introduce the contenders and work some chemistry. First, you pump in aerosolized zirconium tetrachloride, which naturally occurs as individual molecules. These particles battle, but eventually settle into a thin sheet on the catalyst. But we want zirconium dioxide, so for that we need oxygen. Let's try water. Hydrogen and chlorine are friendly, and they can be rinsed away, leaving us with a one atom thick sheet of zirconium dioxide. Mission accomplished. Rinse and repeat until you have the amount that you need. All right, now, the question you may be asking yourself is, how do the nanoparticles we just made make their way into the products that we use? Well, oftentimes this is the simplest part of the process. It's important to note that Due to their size and unique chemical properties, objects on the nanoscale are almost entirely unaffected by gravity or other normal forces. Instead, intermolecular forces do most of the work. Add these nanoparticles to the chemicals that make up the paints or plastics or fabrics that you use and they become just another part of the mixture, while still maintaining their unique qualities. Therefore, many times the process of mixing them into products is as simple as, well, mixing. As we master the art of modeling, creating, and shaping nanomaterials, a whole world of possibilities begin to open up. One thing is certain, however, a lot more work goes into making sure your socks are clean and your water is fresh than you may have ever realized. <laughs>